Hello, this is Jeannie Wharton, the Vice President of NABA, welcoming all of you to this Zoom chat. This is a special member benefit, and we're so happy that you all can be here. We have some good news in the NABA world. We have two new chapters, one in Southern California and one in South Carolina. Also represented in our call tonight are some of my favorite people, my staff, Laura Bianco, Mike Gerboni, Jim Springer is from our board, and, and uh, we're so happy that they could join us tonight. We'll have a little period of Q&A later, but please mute your sound now. And let's get ready to hear Marianne. I know she's going to give us a lot of great information. Our presenter is Marianne Borge, and she is a naturalist, photographer, and educator, an author, and a terrific photographer. And she's the editor of NABA's Butterfly Gardener. Welcome, Marianne. We're so glad you could join us today. Thank you, Jean. Um, I'm happy to be here. So today's topic is asters, basically members of the um, aster family, plants in the aster family. And really every gardener needs to be interested in the aster family because it is a huge family. It's a family of plants that has evolved so that there's some species for every possible habitat niche, um, sunny places, uh, shady places, dry places, moist places, meadows, woodlands. There are aster family members that have evolved to be successful in every single one of those possible habitats in, throughout the world. The, and it's, it's one of the largest families, depending on the source that you uh, refer to. There are some sources that say that it's the second largest family of plants with over 23,000 members, second only to the orchids. And I recently um, ran into another uh, source that said that it was actually the largest family, even surpassing the orchids, which wouldn't surprise me because the aster family members can tend to be a little on the, let me say, promiscuous side. So they're um, they hybridize freely and maybe ending up creating some new species. Um, but anyway, it's a really interesting family. Um, what's represented here in this photograph is one of the more typical members that you would think of as part of the aster family. But we'll find out that there are others that are not quite as typical as you would expect. There are more plants in this family than you might expect. So first of all, what characterizes members of the aster family? What makes them different from the flowers of other plants or um, in other families? And if we look at the two images shown here, the one on the left is um, a plant called bloodroot that's native in the area where I live and in um, a good part of the Eastern part of the United States. It's a spring ephemeral, so it's only seen at the, in the early part of the year, the first few weeks of the season. And we can see that it has petals and there's some, I don't know, yellow stuff here in the center that we'll talk about in a minute. And over here on the right-hand side, we see a member of the aster family. Um, this happens to be a New England aster. And it's got what looks like to me like petals and a bunch of yellow stuff in the center. So, so what's different here? What's different? What makes the uh, aster family members different from a standard um, non-aster family flower? And I'm going to have to resort to a little bit of body here, but a, a standard non-aster flower, a classic flower, has the possible parts that are depicted here. Um, they're flower parts that are basically in whorls um, as you go from the outside of the flower to the inside. And these parts are mostly optional, actually. Not every flower has each one of these parts, but if they're all present, if we start at the outside of the flower, the flower parts that we would see are called sepals, and they act basically as bud scales that protect the flower before it opens. Sometimes they're quite showy, and they're actually part of the display that attracts pollinators to come to visit the flower. The next whorl of uh, plant parts or flower parts that we would see potentially would be petals, and the function of petals is to attract pollinators to come to visit, to pick up pollen and take it to another plant. Um, the next whorl of uh, flower parts within the flower would be the male reproductive parts called stamens. 
They consist of a filament, which positions the anther at the tip, um, and the anther is what disperses the pollen. And in the very center are the female reproductive parts, which consist of a stigma at the tip, which is where pollen has to be placed in order for pollination to take place. The pollen grains travel down the style till they get to the ovules in the ovary to achieve pollination. All of these flower parts rest on a single receptacle, which is at the tip of the flower stem or peduncle. Botanists like to make up these names to make the rest of us feel like it's a, something special, but it's a stem really. Okay, so if we take a look at an example, this is again, another um, spring blooming plant that's a typical standard flower that is not an aster family member. And if we look, um, here, peeking out from behind the petals, we can see a sepal. And again, that acts as a bud scale to protect the flower. Um, then we see the petals that are there to attract the pollinators that we see to come visit, drink some nectar, pick up some pollen and take that to another flower. Um, then we see the stamens, the male reproductive parts. And in the very center, we see the pistil, the female reproductive part. Um, there are variations on this thing. Not every species has all of these flower parts. And even when they do, there are variations on it. Over here in the lower right, um, there's another flower represented called white beard tongue, sometimes called penstemon beard tongue. And here we see that there are petals, but those petals are fused to form a tube. So just a little bit of a variation. Even within standard flowers, there are variations. Different species have evolved to try different strategies to be successful. And here's another strategy. Again, this is a flower cluster for um, hobblebush viburnum. It also is um, uh, a strategy that's shared by another one of the viburnums, um, excuse me, cranberry bush viburnum. And it may look familiar to you if you're um, familiar with um, hydrangeas. What we see here is a cluster of flowers of two different types. There are these large showy flowers around the outside of the flower cluster. And in the center are small flowers and more of them. The function of these large flowers around the outside is strictly to be showy, to attract pollinators to come visit the small flowers in the center. And we can see that there is a little pollinator in the center. This is one of the flower flies visiting the flowers. These large flowers are sterile. They have no reproductive parts whatsoever. The, it's the uh, small flowers in the center of this inflorescence or flower cluster that do the work of reproduction. Um, the big flowers are just there just to attract pollinators to come visit the small flowers. So these small flowers do have reproductive parts and I can see the little anthers sticking up all over the place. So a pollinator just needs to walk across from one flower to another and is probably gonna be picking up pollen on the underside of its body and taking it to another flower, another plant. So what's different? How are aster family flowers different? Um, well, let's take a look. It, it looks like we have um, petals here, and we do, but there's sort of a, a, a twist on that story. And we have some stuff in the center, but what we see here is actually not a single flower. It's actually a cluster of many different flowers of two different types. The um, petal-like things are called ray flowers, and they are flowers that consist of a single petal. In the center, we have a very tightly clustered group of um, another type of flower called a disc flower. And I'll show you a little bit more about those in just a minute. Um, so this is a little bit like the strategy that we saw here in that this is a cluster of many different flowers packed together to try to make the most of the resources of this plant in order to try to reproduce. Plants are all about reproducing, surviving and reproducing. And so in the center, we have some disc flowers just beginning to open and some that are still in bud. Let's take a closer look. Um, in an aster 
inflorescence or flower cluster, sometimes called a composite flower or a flower head. Um, again, you can have two different types of flowers, ray flowers, which are these petal-like things that we see. And in fact, it is a flower that only has a single petal that may or may not have reproductive parts. Uh, and in the center, there are many um, tubular flowers where the petals have fused to create a tiny little tube. And these are called disc flowers. All of these flowers share a common receptacle instead of having their own receptacle. And they share also a common set of um, sort of leaf-like parts called bracts that help protect the flower, especially before it opens. They perform much the same function that sepals do for the non-aster family flowers. So the aster family members are really packing a lot of um, action into a small space. And what looks to us like a single flower is actually many flowers, potentially of two different types. This particular aster has both ray flowers and disc flowers. And we can see that there's a there are flies here that are mating, while one of them is dining at the same time. Um, but there are other aster family members that just have ray flowers. For example, dandelions. There are other aster family members that just have disc flowers. This is a plant called blue mist flower. And this has only disc flowers. And we'll see several other examples of that as we go through the presentation. Um, the, the basic strategy is to pack a lot of action into a small space. Uh, the reproductive parts are sticking up beyond the small flowers, easily um, touching the undersides of the pollinators that are visiting these flower clusters. And you can see that they're attractive to butterflies. The term aster is derived from both the Greek and Latin uh, terms for star or star-shaped. And in fact, this sort of resembles the sun. Uh, the aster family members, we have just a few, tiny few represented here. Again, there are, you know, well over 23,000 members of the aster family. Depending on what source you read, there may be as many as 30. Um, the most classic of the asters probably would be New England aster, which is what we see in the center. The flowers that the plants whose flower clusters or inflorescences have both ray flowers and disc flowers, but there are so many others. The goldenrods are also members of the aster family, uh, often blooming at the same time as the uh, species like New England asters. Um, a couple of my personal favorites from my garden are blue wood aster and white wood aster, shade plants. Um, members of the aster family. Um, things like beggar ticks are members of the aster family. Cone flowers, bone sets, joe pie weeds. Um, so many different species are members of the aster, aster family. And we'll see a few of them as we go through. I did wanna mention that, um, I don't know about you, but I always sort of associate asters with the late summer and fall, especially the fall, because they're just, especially prolific at this time of year. But there are aster family members that are blooming throughout the growing season. And um, where I live, I'm from New Jersey, or I, I live in New Jersey anyway. Um, early in the spring, there are aster family members that are blues, blooming, including this um, chrysanthemum, a member of the aster family called green and gold or Virginia golden star. And if we look, we can see that it has both ray flowers and in the center, we have a cluster of tiny little disc flowers. Those disc flowers, by the way, open over a period of usually many weeks. So it's really a good strategy for the asters and for the pollinators that like to come visit because it gives the plant many weeks worth of opportunity to be pollinated and reproduce. And that works for the pollinators because it gives them some food for many weeks as well. Um, another spring bloomer um, is golden ragwort. This species is um, found in probably the eastern half of the United States, but um, there are closely related species of the same genus, Pacara, 
that you can find throughout North America, basically. Um, and this, again, we can see that it consists of both ray flowers and disc flowers. And here it's hosting one of the sweat bees. And here you can see it in my shade garden. Um, and this species actually does well in both shade and sun. It's, um, it spreads more readily in the sun than it does in the shade, but it does uh, do well in both environments. Another aster family member that you might not expect would be the pussy toes, the, the Antenarias. Uh, this particular species is plantain leaved pussy toes. And again, you can find um, related species, Antenarias, pretty much throughout North America. Um, this is an interesting twist because, uh, or this species has an, offers an interesting twist in that it has male and female flowers on separate plants. When I showed you the, the classic flower, um, you don't have to have, not every species has chosen to have all of those reproductive parts on every plant. Um, some of you can probably think of species that you know that have male and female flowers on separate plants. Hollies are sort of well known for this, so, but they're not the only ones. Um, the pussy toes also have male and female flowers on separate plants. And this is um, the um, pussy toe that has male flowers. And to me, it looks like little birthday cupcakes with candles on it. But anyway, those are the male reproductive parts sticking up, being visited by a wasp. And this is what the female flowers look like. And here we have, again, the reproductive parts are sticking up, just waiting to tickle the undersides of uh, a potential pollinator. Here it's a fly coming to visit the flowers. Um, the pussy toes are one of the food plants for American lady butterflies. So the aster family member provides not just pollen nectar, but also several of them are plants for butterflies and uh, moths, caterpillars. So um, they're really important for that purpose as well. And if you're thinking of pearly everlastings or the cudweeds that the American ladies might use, those are also members of the aster family. Early summer aster family members that are blooming might be the hawkweeds or cynthias or flea banes. This picture uh, photograph shows common flea bane being visited by a couple of flies. If I haven't mentioned it before, flies are an important pollinator uh, in addition to bees and butterflies as well. So. But it's probably later in the season we see most members of the Esther family in bloom, doing their thing. And here's we have the iconic New England Aster in a field of goldenrod. And this to me is just classic in terms of uh, the, the Aster family and its representation later in the season. Both of these plants are members of the Aster family. Um, we'll the few are a little different in that they just have disc flowers. This is a species called New York ironweed. Um, it's there are Veronia species, species of this genus throughout much of the United States and also in Ontario and Manitoba. Um, so you may see something that's slightly different where you live, but you hopefully it'll be sort of similar. What will be similar is that. The flower clusters consist of disc flowers only. And you can see that they open from the outside of the cluster to the inside um, over again, a period of many weeks, making food available for lots of different pollinators, including this Eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly um, over the many weeks that it's blooming. For me, this is typically in bloom by early July, early to mid July through much of August. Most of, again, most of the species that I'm showing, if the exact species is not present in your area, something in the genus probably is. There are a few Western states that um, some of these have less representation. Uh, the thistles are members of the aster family. And the thistles kind of get a bad rap. Many thistles are actually biennials. They only live for two years. And the species that I'm showing here, field thistle, is one of those. And biennials are plants that basically only live for two years. The first year you would see um, 
what's referred to as a basal rosette of leaves, leaves at the base of the plant. The second year, the flower shoot comes up and the flowers bloom. And if all goes well, they get pollinated. And here we can see that they provide a banquet for lots of different pollinators. These um, great spangled frit fritillaries are loving it. We have a bumblebee butt over here. Um, in this image, we have um, a honeybee, a bee that actually specializes on the pollen of the thistles and a hummingbird moth. So really important sources of nectar um, for lots of different critters. The blazing stars are also members of the aster family and also disc flowers only. Um, and we can see here that it's being enjoyed by one of the monarchs and one of the skippers. Again, these are disc flowers only. The Joe pie weeds, again, disc flowers only. I um, am the count coordinator for the butterfly count circle that uh, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve hosts. And I always try to um, schedule it when the Joe pie weeds will be blooming because they're always a really reliable place to find lots of pollinators and lots of butterflies. Here in this picture, we can see, let's see, one, two, three, four Eastern tiger swallowtails, one, one, two, three peck skippers all on one plant. So great source of nectar for lots of different butterflies, but other pollinators as well. The bone sets are aster family members. Um, I should also mention that the aster family, there's so many benefits. Um, they provide food for pollinators. They provide food for other animals like birds who might be eating the seeds that are produced later in the season. Um, they also have medicinal sources and boneset is a species that even has medicinal uses for people. Um, it's been used to treat dengue fever um, which is also sometimes called breakbone fever, which is where bone set comes from in terms of the name. Um, white snake root is uh, another species that looks similar to the bone set, but it's actually in a different genus. This has uh, an interesting strategy for protecting itself from being eaten. These medicinal chemicals are often present in plants because plants are trying to protect themselves from some of the same pressures that we face. Could be bacteria, could be a fungus. Um, okay, they may face a pressure that we don't like being eaten by um, omnivores um, or uh, critters that would like to eat plants. Where I live, there are more deer than we really have food for. And um, so a plant like white snake root is really uh, beneficial in that it has toxic chemicals to prevent itself from being eaten by herbivores. So it's pretty deer proof. And the, um, the toxins are so successful that uh, unfortunately they were the source of uh, Abe Lincoln's mother's death. If cattle graze on plants on the white snake root and then give milk, if a human drinks that milk, they could actually become sick or even dead. And that's what happened to uh, Abe Lincoln's mother. So it's a pretty effective protection. So, but again, sometimes we're able to benefit from the protective chemicals that plants produce to prevent themselves from being eaten. Plants have this love-hate relationship with animals. They wanna attract pollinators to come help them with cross-pollination. They wanna attract, frequently, they wanna attract somebody to come and help disperse their seeds. That isn't always true. Um, these, many of the aster family members actually partner with the wind to disperse their seeds. They don't depend on animals to eat their fruit and disperse their seeds later. Um, but many, many plants do. But um, the that's the love part of the relationship. The let's keep ourselves at arm's length part is they provide, uh, they produce chemicals or other deterrents to, um, to save themselves because it's all about surviving and then reproducing. Okay, the golden rods are part of the aster family. Um, we have, there are golden rods that are appropriate for more casual settings for open meadows. Uh, some of the species that would be appropriate for that in the area where I live are listed here. You'll find others. Most of, well, 
quite a number of the goldenrods are in the genus Solidago. So you can just look for species with that genus. Um, there are a couple of other genuses that um, goldenrods are in as well. Um, but we can see that the goldenrods, although the flowers are small, they do have both uh, ray flowers and disc flowers, but they're small flower heads or flower clusters, but they're still plenty big enough to provide nectar for our butterflies that are looking for late season sources of food. The goldenrods actually host hundreds of insects. Um, and a reason to leave your plants, your perennials standing through the winter after they've done their thing in terms of blooming is because there are many insects that may be surviving inside of them. Here we have a couple of examples. These are both on the left and the right. These are both referred to as galls. This on the left is referred to as a rosette gall caused by a midge that's developing inside the stem of, oops, sorry, of this plant, um, which has caused the growth, the upward growth of the stem to stop. But um, some, in many cases, the plant continues to branch out and continues to bloom beyond that. But there's a little midge that is developing inside that stem that will emerge in the spring. And I have read that over 60 other species of insects are actually hosted by the habitat provided by this rosette gall. It's um, basically the leaves. And in this photo, they're all kind of dried up, but um, the leaves kind of cluster at that particular spot. So there are many different insects that are benefiting from this. On the right-hand side, um, this is called a goldenrod ball gall for obvious reasons. It looks like a perfect ball. And inside there, a fly is developing, a goldenrod gall fly. Um, if it's lucky, it will make it through adulthood and emerge in the spring. There are other predator insects that might try to get it first. And birds have learned that this is a good source of insect food, even during the winter. Um, we might think of birds as eating insects in the spring, but really throughout the year, insects are an important source of food for birds. And this downy woodpecker has learned to peck into the galls to get some food during the winter. Chickadees are also able to do that. Um, there are other goldenrods that are a little bit smaller, you know, more um, suited for a smaller space like a garden. And some of the species that I like to see in gardens are showy goldenrod, which we see over on the left-hand side, which can have a spike or, or a branch spike of um, pretty good sized flower heads. We can see each one of these little individual flower heads consisting of both ray flowers and disc flowers. Um, and they're able to host lots of different pollinators. Um, this is grass leaf goldenrod in the center, which is good for meadows or a sunny garden. Um, it does like to spread, so you might have to keep your eye on it if you don't want it to take over the whole garden. And here it's uh, providing nectar for a gray hair streak. And from my own shade garden is a species called wreath goldenrod or blue stemmed goldenrod um, that does well in a woodland understory or a shade garden. Other species not shown here, um, but listed here are also potential garden uh, candidates. And again, if you're a shade gardener like me, zigzag goldenrod works well. Now, this time of year, many people have problems with allergies and they look around and they see that, you know, their eyes start to get itchy, their nose is running, they're sneezing, it's driving them nuts. And they look around and they see the bright, fields of goldenrod blooming and they blame goldenrod for their allergies, but it's not goldenrod. It's ragweed that's blooming at this time of year, or it could be grasses as well, but um, it's definitely not the goldenrods. Any species that has bright showy flowers like goldenrods do, or any of the other species that we've seen, has evolved a strategy to attract pollinators to come to those bright showy flowers, to pick up their pollen, and take it to another plant. So the pollen is sort of heavy and waxy. It's manufactured, it's designed to stick to a body, uh, an insect body usually. It's not something that's going to be carried through the wind. It's the plants that have inconspicuous flowers like the ragweeds do. And we can see the spikes of flowers 
You could walk right past the ragweeds and not even notice them because they're so inconspicuous, because their strategy is to be wind pollinated, not to attract pollinators, not to attract animals to come help them with pollination. So there's no point in wasting resources on pretty flowers. Inconspicuous flowers work just fine. The wind doesn't care. The pollen just has to be available. It has to be light. It has to be fluffy, easily carried by the wind. And that's the strategy of the goldenrods. Um, it's also the strategy of many grasses that are late season bloomers and also a lot of trees that bloom in the spring. So that's why you tend to have allergic reactions at those times of the years. But it's it's never the cause, it's never caused by uh, plants that have bright showy flowers because their pollen doesn't float in the wind. Ragweed pollen flows through the wind and just as easily goes up your nose as to another ragweed. But even the ragweeds, by the way, are members of the aster family and support their food plants for some butterflies and moths. Um, many birds eat the seeds that are produced. So even ragweed um, has its place in nature. Um, Black-eyed Susan and its lookalikes and other cone flowers are all members of the aster family. You know, and again, we think of this, oh, there's a flower, but it's actually a cluster of flowers. It's um, a flower head, if you will, consisting of ray flowers and disc flowers. Um, and there are actually a few different species native where I live that um, are very similar looking to black-eyed Susan, and they're shown here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just mention the one on the left because um, I just like it, but it's up to you. Showy coneflower probably looks the most like black-eyed Susan and the flower heads are probably a little bit more um, showy even than black-eyed Susan. The plant on the left, thin-leaved coneflower, I sort of like because it blooms for a really long period of time. The flower heads are smaller than black-eyed Susan, but it's a many branched plant so that it, it can get sort of bushy and have lots of flowers on it. And it blooms usually into November, which in New Jersey is pretty good. So anyway, the cone flowers, including the black eyed Susan lookalikes, and there are others like prairie cone flower, um, um, purple cone flower, member of the aster family. All of those are aster family members. And all of them have ray flowers. All the cone flowers have ray flowers and disc flowers. This is one of my personal favorites, green-headed coneflower. It's also called cut-leaved coneflower, Rebecca laciniata. Um, I like it because you can so easily see the disc flowers that you, know, you really get it. It makes it easy to understand. You can see these individual little ray flowers and you can see the disc flowers. And they, again, open over a period of many weeks. Um, they start from the bottom of the disc and work their way to the top. Um, and when I first encountered these two little critters, they were kind of duking it out. And eventually they realized that, hey, there's plenty of food for both of us. You go eat on one side, I'll eat on the other. We're both fine. So we've got an American copper and a bumblebee, both dining on different disc flowers on the same plant, on the same flower head. So that's pretty good. And the other thing I like about this is that I never fail to see goldfinches browsing for the seeds that are produced once these little pollinators have done their jobs. Gray-headed coneflower is another example. This one has sort of curved back petals or ray flowers with disc flowers, again, blooming from the bottom of this cluster to the top. Wing stem, uh, this is native throughout much of the United States. Um, there are other um, closer related plants in the same genus, which also can be found uh, in much of the United States if one species or the other. And you can see it has um, sort of a sparse number of ray flowers, but they're showy enough. And the disc flowers are pretty big and they make a nice little pom-pom like display. And we can see that they're also appealing to lots of different pollinators. And in this case, we've got several different sweat bees coming to visit. I see butterflies also um, frequently. And um, here we can see 
that the strategy really works of having your um, flowers clustered closely together and having an insect just sort of walking across those flowers going from one to the other. Look at the pollen that that bee is picking up to be able to take to another plant. Pretty good strategy. Um, this is one of my personal favorites because I just think the flower heads are so pretty. Uh, the ray flowers are actually notched. They have uh, three little um, lobes at the tips of the ray flowers. And then again, a, a really good sized cluster of disc flowers in the center, blooming over many weeks, providing um, nectar and, and pollen for any visitors, nectar for this butterfly. Don't be put off by the name sneezeweed. It's not an exception to the rule that I just gave you that um, plants with showy flowers do not cause allergies. This parts of this, this plant were dried and used for snuff and pretty much anything that you put up your nose is gonna make you sneeze. So that's where that name came, came from. It's not that the pollen will uh, cause you allergies. And so the marketing folks are sometimes trying to call this Helen's flower after the genus um, to make it a little bit more socially acceptable, but it's really a great garden plant. It's so pretty. Uh, all of the sunflowers are members of the aster family. And we see one of them represented here. This one is thin-leaved sunflower, um, Helianthus decapetalus, referring to 10 petals. And on average, there are typically 10 ray flowers, but there could be more or less. Um, the beggar ticks are all members of the aster family. Beggar ticks are typically annuals, most species. We've got three species represented here. Tick seed sunflower, which is fairly common, um, at least where I live. Um, nodding burr marigold, which really likes moist locations. And beggar ticks, which is a pretty inconspicuous plant. And it really doesn't have, it, it primarily has disc flowers. These plants are called beggar ticks because of their um, strategy for being dispersed in terms of their seeds, the fruits that are developed and the seeds that are being produced, um, which we can see that they have little prongs that are used to hitch a ride, typically on some unsuspecting mammal to take the seeds to a different location. Occasionally those mammals are you or me, but probably more often other mammals. And then we come to our classic asters. New England aster, I think of as really probably the most classic of all the asters. And in spite of its name, it's actually native throughout much of North America. Um, it has beautiful purple, typically uh, ray flowers, sometimes pink, the color can vary a bit. And in the center, we see the disc flowers here. And here we see it's being visited by a bee. Aromatic aster is a favorite of mine. It's um, fairly similar looking. It's sort of like a shorter, bushier New England aster. Uh, the flower heads themselves are very similar to New England aster, um, but the, the, the whole structure of the plant is a bit shorter, quite a bit shorter, and tends to be more branched and bushy looking. So it's just covered with blossoms. It's really fabulous and appealing to lots of different pollinators, both bees and butterflies like this common buckeye. Um, there are many small white asters. I've shown just two here. Um, this is all asters, Symphiotrichum pelosum, or uh, on the left and calico aster um, on the right. Um, calico aster is pretty um, eclectic in its habitats, actually. I see it growing in woodland understories. I see it growing in open meadows. Um, one of the things I like about it is that it um, is sort of easy to identify. And one of its characteristics are that on the, the um, branches that are flowering, some of the leaves point backwards toward the main branch of the plant, the main stem of the plant. So that's kind of a nice ID characteristic. Um, both of these, all of these provide lots of food for pollinators like the um, sulfur, the orange sulfur we have here over on the left, the pearl crescent, 
in the center. Um, they're great for lots of different pollinators. And just sort of make a mental note, we're seeing some disc flowers here that are sort of pinkish and some that are yellow. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, white wood aster is another example of um, an aster family member that is a good woodland understory plant. I have this in my shade garden here at home. Um, the ray flowers are sort of sparse, but they're quite showy. And the disc flowers um, are the ones that provide all the food. Blue wood aster is one of my personal favorites uh, for my own shade garden here. And um, this for me begins to bloom of late September, usually the last week of September. My husband's always, when is that gonna bloom? When is that gonna bloom? And I, the last week of September. And then they keep blooming until typically early November. And I get all kinds of pollinators, including butterflies into late October, early November on this plant. And let's take a moment to just look more carefully at these disc flowers because they're kind of interesting. So we've got some disc flowers that are yellow, some that are pink. And here in this one flower head, we've got some of both pink and yellow. And let me think, everybody that's trying to get something to drink from these flowers are visiting the yellow flowers. That's pretty interesting. And that's because many of these aster family members um, have evolved the uh, strategy of changing the flower uh, color. So the disc flowers on, in this genus at least, typically begin as yellow. And after they've been pollinated and they're no longer producing nectar and pollen, they no longer have a need to attract a pollinator to come visit them, the flowers turn sort of a pink or reddish color. Um, one of the reasons for that is that bees are red color blind, so they're less likely to be attracted to those colors. But it's a signal to pollinators that those flowers are closed for business. The yellow flowers, they're the ones that are open for business. Come and get it. So it's a really interesting and effective strategy for both um, the insects who are coming to visit because they don't have to waste their time visiting a flower that's no longer producing the nectar or in the case of bees, pollen that they're interested in. And also it helps to protect the, um, the developing fruits in the uh, flowers that have already been pollinated. So it's a really effective strategy of these aster family members. I think it's pretty cool. So, when you're looking for aster family members, you wanna look for species that are native to your area. And why is it that native plants are important? It's because they provide food, shelter, medicine for all species, including humans. But if you're a butterfly gardener, um, butterflies can drink nectar from lots of different plants, but they're caterpillars, as I'm sure you all know, have evolved each of them to be pretty specific about their caterpillar food requirements. So caterpillars to me are one of the most um, effective ways to understand the relationship between native plants and the animals that they support. Um, and we're among those that benefit from them. We're kind of lucky in that we're, uh, we're pretty eclectic in what we can eat, where we can live, but many butterflies and other insects and birds are much more specific about what their requirements are. And using native plants will support the native butterflies and all the other insects and the other animals that depend on those insects in your region. And these plants also produce the oxygen that we need to breathe. And there's so many studies now that show that being out in nature um, is beneficial to our health. And I think there are many reasons for that. One of them is that plants are emitting chemicals oxygen being one, but other chemicals as they um, breathe, as they transpire. And um, we're ingesting some of those chemicals and some of those chemicals are beneficial and health giving. Um, these plants also help to mitigate climate change and help to manage uh, storm water for those of us who have too much um, and they don't require the kind of water that you would need for watering a lawn for those of us who don't have enough rainwater. So um, use plants, native plants as much as possible. 
where can you learn about plants that are native to your region? Well, your local NABA chapter is one place that usually you can get some pretty good information about that. Um, most states and provinces have native plant societies that um, provide information for your region. And there's another group that's uh, relatively new, at least uh, for me, I've known about it for a few years, called the Wild Ones that also is um, important for promoting native plants that can provide you with good information. There are also some really good websites, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, uh, National Audubon Society Native Plants Database, National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder, all um, have really good online resources where you can just put in your zip code and they'll give you back a list of plants that are native to your region. Often they'll let you um, uh, provide other search criteria to limit the search even more if you're looking for something more specific. Um, and then there are other resources that may be specific to your region. In New England, there's the Native Plant Trust. Um, here in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, there's Bowman Hill Wildflower Preserve. I had to put in a plug for them because I teach classes there. And you may know of others in your region. So if you do and you wanna share that with other people who are here in the, uh, feel free to enter them in the chat. Uh, yeah, I see somebody has, is mentioning wild seeds in uh, Maine. Yes, that's another good one. Excellent. Um, and just because it's fall, I give you a reminder, don't forget to leave the leaves. Don't blow those leaves out of your flower beds. Leave them there. Also leave your standing spent perennials because both provide shelter for overwintering butterflies in various life cycle stages, as well as many other insects. And they provide food for lots of animals who are looking for something to eat. So um, leave the leaves and your spent perennials. And that's about it. Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, Marianne, this has just been wonderful and we appreciate you so much doing this. Uh, I'm so glad that you could join us. Does anyone have questions? Uh, you can unmute yourself. We appreciate you all, uh, you know, being quiet while we're uh, listening to Marianne because it was just so terrific. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yes, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go Marianne. ahead, please. Yes. Could you could you go back to the calico aster, please, and show us what you mean by the leaves pointing down to the stem? We have a bunch of very small asters like that in the uh, Richmond, Virginia area, and it's a constant battle over people who cannot identify what is what. And if there were a way that I could be sure of calico asters, it would help me tremendously. Um. It's really tricky. I have to say these small white asters are really tricky. And there are, um, so I teach a couple of classes about the asters at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve where I go into more detail. But um, one of the characteristics that I like to use for calico aster is that, um, you know, typically the leaves are going like horizontally, going straight out from the branch that they're on for many species. But if you see calico aster often, you'll see some pointing backwards to the main stem of the plant. And these are some of the examples that I can give you for that. Okay. But I will caution you that um, I mentioned in my early remarks that um, the esters are kind of promiscuous and I've seen calico aster, um, I've seen blue wood aster look, looking like it's crossed with calico aster. And I've seen it crossed with another species that I haven't shown called big leaf aster. Both those species are supposed to have white ray flowers and I've seen them with um, blue flowers. And I, um, so um, there's, you know, they're out to get us, no. <laughs> um, well, we do refer to them as the darn composites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, just one other thing. So if you want to get really esoteric, some of the small white asters, um, the bracts are a way to tell them apart. I've only shown a couple of species here. There are two others that you can find in my area um, that you can tell the difference between the bracts, whether the bracts are curved back. And I don't know if you remember, but for example, these are the bracts. Um, they've 
act as, as sort of bud protectors before the flower heads open. And even those things can be identification characteristics that are important. So it can get really um, kind of esoteric to be able to tell them apart. And then, like I said, then there's that, you know, whole um, crossbreeding kind of thing. So <laughs> anyone else have questions? Uh, this has just been wonderful. Your pictures are terrific. Thank you. And your information is always great. We had uh, several people on, several uh, different chapters of NABA were represented. And again, this is recorded. So here in a few days, we'll get it posted on the NABA website and you can uh, watch it again or share it with some of your friends and encourage them to join so they can be part of this next time. All right. Um, I do have a question. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm originally from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and I used to go there with my father as a child and hiked the trails at, at the Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. So that was a lot of fun and it's cool. Brings back fond memories. Okay. So yeah, my question is at the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, yeah. they usually have on their beds mulched leaves or they have in the past. And I'm just wondering if there's some way to maybe mulch some of the leaves to use as compost or or mulch you know with a with a lawnmower or leaf mulcher but you know i, I need kind of a hybrid solution <laughs> to right. mulch, be able to mulch some but leave them and i'm just wondering if that is safe as far as the insects that could be on those leaves if you could just clarify you know if there's a hybrid solution to uh, leaving the leaves but also using some as well there, there's always a hybrid solution, but it's it's a choice that you make. Um, you know, I live in a townhouse development, and so, so there's only so much we can do here. I, if you've heard me before, you may have heard me mention that I've I've gotten permission to um, have a large bed of native plants right next to our house, and we and there are trees there, and the leaves fall, and we just leave the leaves, don't have to do anything, um, but. Um, on the lawns, for example, we have no choice really. I mean, it, it would be difficult. We're just about to transition to a new grounds maintenance company. And this company at least will use a mulching mower um, rather than blow the leaves away, take them off, you know, the, I don't know, it's such a waste. Um, but whenever you do something like that, um, you're making a choice. If you're chopping up leaves, you're probably going to be killing insects, no question about it. Um, but you have to make a choice. You may or may not have um, any place that you can put them. Some things you can do, like where you can leave the leaves, just stay where they fall, that's the best thing you can do. Other things you can consider are um, having an area where you can compost those leaves, you know, like maybe have sort of a uh, a fencing that you could put them in to keep them in one place, or maybe they'll be stable enough on their own um, to put them in one place if you don't have enough space because you have some lawn or whatever. First of all, get rid of that lawn as much as you can. So then that's <laughs> less of a problem. Um, but, uh, you know, composting is another option. Um, if you do that, I would not chop up the leaves. I would just compost them, put them over in their own special space and just compost them. Um, you're going to do much less harm to insects that are in those leaves if you do that. The minute you start chopping things up, you're probably going to be chopping up insects. But, you know, it's always a choice that we have to make. So I, I was hoping I was hoping there would be a timing, like if you just catch it right yeah. after leaf fall, <laughs> if you could maybe... No. Make no, <laughs> nothing's ever that easy. Um, <laughs> and, and right after leaf fall, definitely not, because many of these insects are surviving the winter in these leaves. Yeah, so, that's where they are. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, some people say that, um, you know, like after the temperature reaches 50 degrees, you're fine, go ahead. But, you know, different insects emerge at different times of the year. It just depends on your life cycle. So, um, you know, like the later you can put it off, the better, because the fewer critters you're going to be disturbing or killing. Um, but, you know, honestly, the less we interfere, the, the better. If we could only... <laughs> If we could only give more of our uh, space over to 
you know, the, the critters that we cohabit with. And I'm bit by bit um, having an influence in my homeowners association. So we're, that's we're, great. We're kind of well positioned. That's great. Yeah. So one of the things that was just, that just came up in the chat is where to see this after we've posted the videos. When you log into NABA.org, and by the way, we're getting a new website. I can't wait. When you log in as a member, there's a drop down menu and you can go and it says NABA Talk and NABA TV. NABA Talk is our listserv where you can share pictures and talk about identification questions and so forth. And the NABA TV is what we're calling this. And it's where all the videos are from the presentations that have been done in the year and a half since I've been at NABA. So we'll uh, send out the link uh, here in the next couple of days too. It'll come to you in an email. All right, um, Stan, did you have a question? Yes, I have something on mute. I have a question about pruning asters. Um, the New England ones in particular can get very leggy, four or five feet tall. Yeah. If you want something more compact for a garden, is it possible to cut them back in midsummer so that they bloom maybe three feet tall rather than four or five feet tall? It is possible to cut them back. Um, I would probably do it a little bit earlier than that, just because like, at least where I live, they tip, I see them start to bloom as early as July. So I wouldn't wanna, you know, cut them off um, just when they're getting ready to bloom. But yeah, you can definitely do that. But also just look for something similar that, you know, is shorter and bushier. Like, I, I don't know where you live, but here, um, New England Aster, like I said, that's um, native most throughout most of the United States and some of Canada also, I believe. Um, but there's also a species called aromatic aster that the flowers are pretty similar, the flower heads, I should say. Um, but it's a shorter, bushier plant. So I can get the same effect without having to go through the effort of um, cutting the back. But absolutely, that's a strategy that you can use. I have two questions real quick. Marianne, the Pearl Crescent, will they use uh, any type of aster as the host plant or is there a specific type? Um, I don't think that they use, I, th I think they're fairly specific. Um, I think that, I, here, let me confess, I don't know specifically which ones they use, but there are, the Pearl Crescents do use some of the asters as caterpillar food. I think that they're probably all in the genus Symphiotrichum but I don't know that they use every species that's in Symphiotrichum because that's a pretty big genus. So um, some of the um, field guides would might be a little bit more specific for, is that, was that Consuelo who asked that question? It is, yeah. Yes. I, I Hi, Hi Consuelo. Hi. Um, uh, I've heard Marianne many times and uh, her composite talks and everything are excellent. So. Oh, she does I a great job that. every time, yeah. Thank oh. you. Now, um, someone just asked if we can share this with non-members and yes, please sh you know, share it with your garden club and different groups uh, and have them join so that they can join us in person next time. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. It's been uh, an hour uh, where we can stay on a little longer if Mary Ann's up to it. Uh, I know it's getting late in the Eastern time zone. Anybody else have a question? This has just been great. I'm so glad to see everybody and get acquainted. And Mary Ann, you always do a super job. Oh, thank you. We'd all applaud, you know, but you wouldn't be able to hear us. So <laughs> I just had a, a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Consuelo. Oh, no, um, I, I clapped. Oh, OK. <laughs> who had the, one. one more person had a question. About, yeah, I think. I'm about sorry. the flowers the um, that turn pink when they've been pollinated. Yes. Do they then get more nectar and would they then turn back yellow again? No, um, it's the plant is super efficient. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the plants can detect that oh, I've been pollinated. The flowers can detect that they've, I'm going to go to a different slide where you can see it better here. So these disc flowers around the outside of this cluster actually bloomed first. And you can see that they're they've turned to pink and the ones in the center are open for business, signaling that with their yellow color. Once they turn pink, that's it, they're done. The um, seeds or fruits are developing and that's it for the season for that flower. 
So no, is that not. true only for asters? Because I thought that flowers kept producing more nectar. They can. I mean, as long as, so it'll be many weeks that these disc flowers are blooming and different plants have different strategies about exactly when they replenish their nectar and how much they produce and all that stuff. Um, and insects have all these strategies for, you know, like leaving little chemical trails saying, oh, I've already visited that one. So I'm not going to go back right away. Or oh, I can tell one of my uh, competitors has already visited that one. So I'm not going to go to that one right away. Um, but yes, as long as while they are open for business, they can replenish their nectar. But their goal, if you will, is to reproduce. It's to, okay, I want to get pollinated, then I can produce, I'm going to call it a fruit. Sometimes it looks more like a seed, but a fruit. And that's my reproductive goal. It's off. I'm good. And now it's uh, up to me to maybe attract somebody to eat that fruit and disperse it through their digestive system or for the wind to take it and disperse it. But um, that's their goal. And so there's no reason for that particular flower to produce any more nectar. Maybe the plant can still produce additional flowers and those flowers can produce nectar. Um, but you know, they just produce nectar until they've won their goal. They've achieved their Thank goal. You. That makes perfect sense. Thanks, Thanks. for the logic. <laughs> um, I have one question that's kind of off topic. Uh, milkweed seed pods, is it late for them to open now? Mine have not opened. I've got a mini grove. Yeah. And it's still, I don't know. Uh, They'll open when they're ready to open. When they're ready. Let's yeah. Yeah. It sounds good. Yeah. You're in New Jersey too, aren't yeah. you, Edie? Yes. Edie, you're, you're in New Jersey. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen some open already and some that are not you know, and so they'll open when they're good. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so I much. I want to acknowledge Edie. I didn't realize she was on the call. Hello <laughs> there. She is uh, the person you hear from when you're in our NABA Butterfly Garden Certification Program. And she can I, help you get those cute signs for your garden and your certification. Uh, I love so, my job. It's so it's great. Been, it's been great to have some of our staff with us and uh, a lot of our volunteers. So it's terrific to see all of you. Thank all you. right. Well, thank you all yeah. so much for being here. And Marianne, again, great applause and lots of praise in the chat. We really appreciate you being here. Oh, I'm happy to do it. Thanks for asking. All right. And if thank anybody you. has anything they'd like to see in Butterfly Gardener, shoot me an email. Let me know. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good night.